I do that God has to punish me? I'm just going to say one word. What? Pill. What? Pill. Pill? Good morning.
Lord, I want to thank you for all those that came out to our Remembrance Day service and, uh, and just uh, for shaking hands with our soldiers and, uh, and uh, with the uh, police sergeant there. And uh, what a wonderful day of coming together and remembering, Lord. Father, as we continue into the second last of our messages on your Holy Spirit and the Spirit within us, Lord, may you cause us to listen carefully to what you have to say that we might take from this place something useful, whether it's a correction, whether it's being lifted up, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, we want to live here with something, whether it's in the, found in a song, in a lyric, in a face, in a, in a scripture, in the message itself, Lord, in a prayer. Now, please let us leave that today with that, and we will thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Ah, we have some, uh, we're going to sing Power in the Blood in a minute. And uh, when it normally goes, there's power, power, right? We're not going to do it that way, all right? So we're going to go to, there is power, 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 power. Of the land, there is pa 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 wonder-working power in the precious land. Right? That's what we're gonna do. Are you ready? It's almost like the na 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 na's from the last time. Na 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 na. This is just pa 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 pa. Okay. Here we go. Would you do service for Jesus? You're kidding. There's power in love. Power in love. Would you the baby is brave to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. God thinks you're having fun, and that's a good thing. Right? Church doesn't have to be gloom and doom. Right? We're here to love the Lord and love each other. Sing. Yes, ma'am. Sing. <laughs> Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power and blood. Power and blood. Come for a bed to Calvary time. There's wonderful power and blood. Here we go. There is power. Like a bird from bridge. 
Christmas, Brian. Who said that? <laughs> you count it down? <laughs> Thank you for resting with me. Thank you, my lovely daughter, for telling us that. You can go back to Garfield now. And because it's because we're doing a little Christmas, because it's Christmas is coming, right? Next week's our last sermon on the, on the Holy Spirit for a while, and then we're into Advent. Advent calendars, Advent candles, all of that stuff is coming out. And so let's practice a little bit here. Angels, we have heard of high, sweetly singing Lord of Blame. And the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strain. Oh, 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 Sing a beautiful song now. 
as we prepare for prayer to pray for our veterans, to pray for the people in our church that couldn't make it here today or those that might be here uh, that are suffering physically or mentally or relationally or financially or spiritually uh, for their lives. We're going to pray for the growth of our church as we reach out into our communities and so much more. And uh, so sing with me uh, a beautiful song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us Is. And you can sing along or you can just listen to the words and uh, prepare your hearts for time of prayer.
concerns. We want to lift to you our joys. We want to lift to you our sorrows and our pain. We want to lift to you our adoration. Father, I know that there are people within this room and those at home watching that may be hurting in ways that I have no idea, Lord. But you do. You knew us knit in our mother's womb. You know the count of hair in our heads. Your word says that you hear us day and night. So I know that you hear us. I know that you are with us. And if we are hurt in some way, Lord, we ask that you just reach into us and pour into us a soothing, healing balm flowing from the very gates of heaven itself upon those things within us, Lord, that need that healing, that need your special touch, that needs your special love and forgiveness and grace and mercy, Lord. Father, I, I just want you to pour into us. If there's, if there's anything, Lord, that preventing us from hearing from you, from experiencing you, from knowing you in a more intimate way this morning, Lord, we ask and give you permission to tear the walls down, tear the barriers down, take the strongholds down, Lord. And as those beautiful words we find in the Old Testament, that you will bring us home, that you will take our heart of, of stone out and put it as our heart of flesh, and you will put your laws and your decrees and your spirit in us, and we will be your people, and you will be our God. And we praise you for that, Lord. We praise you for Father, as we continue to talk about your spirit, as we continue to talk about our spirit and how we react and, and how we interact, Lord, I want you to open our ears to hear and our eyes and our hearts and our minds to receive, Father. That we might leave here with a concrete idea of what you want to say for us, that what you have crafted for each and every one of us, Lord, that we might know you. Thank you, Father. I thank you for this and so much more. In Jesus' name. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice.
reach out and touch people in our communities and touch people within this church family. Thank you, Father. Amen. So we have been talking about the Holy Spirit over the last month, five weeks actually, including today. One more next week, we're going to talk about our circumstances and our experiences. But today, we want to talk about our spirits. We want to talk about God's spirit and our spirits. Andrew Murray, who was a missionary to South Africa, penned these words. He says, may not a single moment of my life be spent outside the light, love, and joy of God's presence and not a moment without the entire surrender of myself as a vessel for him to fill full of his spirit and his love. Said to a revival just before the 1900s. Throughout scripture, God guides you and guides me in a mission, in a directive, in, in, in a forward motion uh, by putting on us special burdens. God speaks to us by these burdens. Now, this is the way it feels. If I say something or do something or act in such a way that's unbecoming of God, we all say it. We all do it by times. But when it comes out of my mouth and when I've done it, the hair in the back of my head, my neck rises right up. I get that feeling. Have you ever been in a, in a CAT scan with that contrast echo, the stuff they put in your IV? I have, right? A couple times. And when they do that, you feel this warmth in your head, and it just flows right down your body and your toes. And if I do something, you know that, right? If I do something wrong or say something wrong, I get that feeling. And I think, okay, Lord, <laughs> I've messed this one up. I'm going to have to make this right, or I'm going to have to apologize. I'm going to have to do something. I get that burden. I know. I don't have to be spoken to directly by anybody. If I'm in line and in tune with the God, if my spirit is aligned with the Holy Spirit, and I do something like that, I get it right away, and I know that I have done that. Nehemiah was on his way to build the walls of Jerusalem. He said this in Nehemiah 2 and 12. And I arose in the night, and a few men with me, and I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem, and there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. He put a burden on him. He put into his mind something that he should do, maybe for himself, for someone in front of you or beside you, someone in your family, someone in your community, for Christ. Paul, when he was in Athens, said he was provoked. Paul preached on Mars Hills in Athens. I have had the pleasure and the, and the privilege of standing on the spot in Athens that Paul preached to the Athenians in those days. Yeah. Amazing. Acts 17 and 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Later he was given ambition to do things. What it means is if we see things that are not right, whether they're in our lives or someone else's lives, God is going to speak to our spirit. God's going to nudge us give us a burden. God's going to give us something that will move us to do something. And a lot of people have not. And I've talked about some other churches where they had some real issues. And, uh, and I talked about a church that we pastored where they had some issues and, uh, and the lady wanted to give a prophecy. And she did. Three weeks after she talked to me about it. We talked about it last week, I think. And the prophecy, I believe, was something like there's a river flowing down and it's flowing around and underneath our church. But things are happening here that probably should not. People are thinking a certain way that they probably should not. And we need to reach out to people as we're not. And, and then she said, but if we don't do things, I see us sitting on a dry bed. No living water. No water at all. And the people there, a lot of them, quenched the Holy Spirit by dismissing what she was saying. They might have been given a burden. They might have been given a push. They might have been given a shove 
in a direction, but they shrugged it off and did nothing. And that particular church is a mere shadow of what it was. And everything that they did in the community, they stopped doing. And it's a shame. It's a shame. When God moves us to do something, to say something, to act in a certain way, when we are, when we are nudged, when we are provoked, when we are given an ambition, we need to follow up and do that. Don't you think that this church or any other church is any different than another church across the land? Churches in Canada are closing at a faster rate than any before in history. Be it Catholic or Wesleyan or Methodist or Mennonite or Baptist or any of them, right? Anglican, United, they're all closing together. Why is that? Some people complain, blame the young people. They're not coming to church anymore. Or they moved away from the town or the city. I, I know a couple of pastors that said, oh yeah, we're, uh, uh, we want to go wherever the Lord wants us to go. But where the Lord wants us to go better have a McDonald's, uh, you know, a Tim Hortons, a mall, uh, you know, maybe an M&M meat store or something else, right? I'll go where God wants me to go as long as it's not as God sprinkles a few things there, right? Far be it, I should go into a small community somewhere. And serve God. When that happens, the spirit is quenched. When we blame other people, the spirit is quenched. Right? It's true. And remember, I told you before that we are masters of the art of explaining away our faults. I didn't do it. I didn't mean to do it. Think about Adam. It was the woman you gave me. It was the serpent, right? Everyone passed the buck. No one wants to take ownership of what they do. That's what we're experts in. We're experts in making excuses for our poor behavior and what we should do and not do. And if we don't get a rein on that, if we don't understand that, if we don't feel that, we're going to be in trouble like all the other churches that are starting to close. Now, I think we're doing fabulous here, but we can't rest on our laurels. We need to be vigilant. Romans 15 and 20. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, Paul said, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. Throughout the years and throughout time, a holy discontent has been sown into God's people and into our spirits. I want to read from 1 Kings and 19. We'll also have it up on the screen here. It's a little small. And I want to talk about Elijah the prophet. Now remember, what was a prophet's job in those days? The job was this. Not to, the job was to go listen to God, listen to God. God speaks. The prophet says to the people, if you keep doing this, this will happen. If you stop doing this, this will happen. Period. Full stop. Not anything else, not fluffing it up. Simply, if you're doing bad and you continue to do bad, as we read in the book of Revelation, I'll remove that lampstand from you. Gone. But if you're doing good and you keep doing good, I'm going to bless you. That's all the prophets did. There's some that foretold the future, right? That eschatological, fancy word, look at end time stuff. But most of the prophets, that's what they did. God said, these people are doing this or not doing that. And if the prophet speaks to us and says, you're not doing this and you should do it, because if you don't, this will happen, we better listen up. We better listen up. It's as simple as that. Let's read from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 to 12. And then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel that have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And so he said, God said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was renting the mountain and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in an earthquake. 
And after the earthquake, the fire, but the Lord was not in a fire. And after the fire, the sounds of a gentle blowing. Now, Elijah just coming off Mount Carmel has just defeated all these hundreds of prophets of Baal and, and Asherah and, and then took them down to the valley. They're all slaughtered, done away with. And, and now he's running away. He's running away. And he runs here to where Moses was. And he runs up to a small cave. This cave right there. And he hides in that cave in, in, Saudi, in, in, the, in Mount Sinai. Or in Sinai, in Jerusalem, right? And he starts, what was me? I'm the only one left. They're coming after me. They want to kill me. Jezebel, the, the wicked queen, wants to kill me and do away with me. And there's no one left. What can I do? Oh, woe is me. But the fact was, there were dozens of other prophets still out there. And Jezebel would be fed to the dogs soon enough. Woe is me. And he was trying to listen and trying to listen, he couldn't hear. And then God said, will you stop? Will you go up to the, to the edge of this cave? Will you sit down? And will you just, for a moment in your life, listen? Open your ears. And that's what God calls us to do as well, is it not? Usually when someone's talking, so we're so busy coming up with an, an excuse, so busy trying to prepare our answer, so busy trying to prepare what we're going to say when they finish talking, that we barely hear what they have to say. And it goes the same with God. God starts speaking to you, think, oh, what have I done, or what can I do, or where am I going to go, or this, and you start busying your head with stuff instead of listening to God, listening to God. We are God's temple, each and every one of us. And God speaks to his people audibly. He spoke to Elijah. He spoke to Samuel. He spoke to Moses. And believe it or not, God spoke to me audibly once. Once. Now the first time that God spoke to me. I was on an island in Ketchumacoochee Park in Nova Scotia. And I was early, early in the morning. The sun was just thinking about coming up. And I was down in the water. I was playing in the water. And was just sort of lapping up against this little island we were camped on. And I clearly had that burden, that feeling, that sense that God was saying, I want you to come into full-time ministry for me. I want you to serve me. And I knew it's what I would do the rest of my life. I had to go back to school four years. I had to figure out how to get there. The school that I'd chosen was 90 minutes south of Buffalo, a place called Houghton College, a liberal arts university. And I thought, how am I going to get there? I don't have a lot of money. We have a family, right? And uh, we just retired from the Navy. And, you know, what are we going to do? And uh, Canjet out of Halifax decided to start an airline. Great. And so I could fly to Toronto for $23. $23! I could fly to Toronto and I could fly back again. And I got the dogmobile from my father, and it's called the dogmobile because it was very doggish. And when it was hot in the summertime, you, five hours with the windows open, right? Because the dog stayed with you. There's no doubt about that. And I did that for four years. And I finally completed my education in divinity and all the rest of the stuff. And Canjet made a decision. They weren't going to fly domestically anymore. They were just going to fly to sun destinations, Cuba and Puerto Rico and wherever. Can I believe that when I accepted God's call to serve him, and it had to be in a place where I couldn't get to and I couldn't really afford to do that, that God would raise up an entire airline just for me so I could go back to school and I could become a, a pastor? I believe he did. You may not believe that. Other people may not believe that. They may think I'd start right they mad. But I believe that God rose up an entire airline so that I might be educated, so that I could serve him. When Isaac was just a, a little guy, about this long, and, and not very long, right? And Lois and I were 45, so we were technically old, right? And, uh, and uh, we had to decide, are we going to keep Elijah? Isaac. Isaac, sorry, and he was in the hospital, or are we going to let him go? And I'm thinking to myself, I know your name. You live upstairs. I know. You feed me 
every day, I know, right? <laughs> Better than a gerbil or whatever. He's got a room, he's got toys, it's, it's great. So, so we had to decide that we're going to keep him at that age. Start all over again. Now we fostered 27 children. We took in 17 teenage throwaways, among other things. You knew, but I said no. And so we got together. I've told you before. And Lois said, okay, I give up. We won't take him. But I was in church that morning. We were in separate churches. And that's when I heard audibly God speak to me. Because I turned around and I was going behind me. But I heard this voice very clear. Said that you will take this young boy and you will raise him as your son. And he is. And he's a wonderful young man. And we haven't had the burdens I thought we might have had growing up. He's 21, going on 22. And life is, is wonderful. And it's wonderful to have him in, in the house and, and with us. And so God can speak to us. And we have a choice to quench that spirit or not. I could have said, no, God, I don't want to keep him, and he would be lost forever to us. But I listened to God, and I listened to Lois in her heart, and Isaac is with us, will be with us the rest of our lives. If we listen clearly, if we are quiet, if we don't continue to try to find a, a way to respond or answers or excuses, God will speak to all of us. And I ask you this morning a simple question when we talk about our spirits and God speaking to our spirits. Are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? What are you listening for? Do you have an expectation that you will experience the Holy Spirit speaking into your spirit? Because God can do that, can he not? Remember, we said it before, we'll say it again. God spoke to us through Moses on a mountaintop. And God spoke to us through the high priest and the holy of holies and the tent tabernacle. And that God speaks to us through the, the temple in Jerusalem and the holy of holies through the high priest. And then God spoke to us through Yeshua, Jesus. And then God spoke to us through the Holy Spirit. That Spirit was put into our hearts. And now we are a temple of God. We are a temple of the Spirit that is within us. And when God speaks to us, He can speak directly into our heart. God is out there, omniscient. God is big. He's transcendent. He's huge. But God is also intimate. He is in our hearts. He's been given to us. He stays there. And God can speak right to us. Habakkuk 2 and 1 says this. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. And how I may reply when I'm reproved. You read those words? Speak to me good. Speak to me because I messed up. Either way, I will keep watch, keep visual. Are you doing that? I'm going to give you 60 seconds, not two minutes like we did the other day. I'm going to give you 60 seconds because one of the things that we can do in church, one of the things we can do when we come together as a faith family is we can spend time listening for or speaking to God. We can set aside a period of time that you might not be able to set aside on your own at home or business or at work. Right? And I've said to you, you have 10,080 minutes in your week. And I'm looking for about 60 or 70 of them. You can keep the other 10,000 in 10 minutes, right? And one of the things we can do is we can be silent. Oh, we'll be serenaded by the kids. That's okay. <laughs> but I want us just for 60 seconds, stand on your rampart. Keep watch. Keep guard. Keep visual. Sit at the out part of the cave. Clear your mind. Empty your mind of excuses, of this, of that, of what's going to happen after church, what happened before the church, what's going on. Like empty your mind for 60 seconds. And while you do that, I'm going to ask God to speak into your lives. And then I want you to hear what he has to say. Let's do that now. Let's take that 60 seconds now. Father, as we fall quiet before you, we ask, Lord, in this precious few moments, 
that you will speak to us, that you will guide us, that you will nudge us, burden us, lift us up, rebuke us, whatever needs to be done, Lord. May we not quench your spirit by thinking of other things. And so please, Lord, church is you, the church is me. We are the church of God. And God makes us his church that we can move out. Do you not know that you are God's temple? Paul says in 1 Corinthians. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. As I told you before, if I do something, say something, think something, do something wrong, I get, ooh, Lord, okay. And I have a choice. We all have choices. We can correct it or not. We can hide and forget. But we have choices. But God convicts us of sin. We may have strongholds within our lives that prevent us from hearing and experiencing in, in an intimate way the Holy Spirit in our lives. Sometimes sin gets in the way. And I have told you before that when God fills us up, when we declare with our mouth that God and Jesus is Lord, when we believe in our hearts that God the Father sent Yeshua to live, to suffer, to die, took our sins to the grave, uh, to the cross, took them to the grave, left them there, and rose victorious to the right hand of the Father, we had everything we needed to live for the Lord. Sometimes we put it up on that shelf, don't we, to collect dust. But we can take it down any time. And the one thing that's stopping the spirit from working in you or stopping the spirit from getting into you might be your sin. Sin. The Holy Spirit guides us in everyday life. Everyday life. We are not saved by our works, Paul said. We are saved by faith through God's grace. But we're to do works. And what he's trying to say is this. If you are saved, if you have the spirit of God within you, if you are walking on the Christian road of life, you will want to do things for God. You will want to do things for your church, for the people around you. I've told you before that if you call me in the middle of the night and say, Pastor, I need you, the only thing I will say to you, even if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, is what can I bring? I'll be right there. And I have done that. And I will do that again. But we should all feel at some point that we can call someone else in our church family and say, I need help. I need someone. I need you. I need a ride. I need something. Can you help out? And the only thing that should come out of our mouth that we're able to go is, what can I bring? I'll be right there. The Spirit guides our everyday life. Now remember, uh, that revelation I had traveling from Darwin uh, with a, a friend of mine one day is that there, there it's, it was a, just a single lane highway, right? So there's one lane and a yellow line on the other lane. And, and people think that the narrow road that leads to the small gate that leads to heaven, there's there, right? But the broad gate, the broad road, wide road leads to the broad gate, leads to hell, that's over here somewhere. And as long as I'm over here and I'm not over there, I should be fine. But what came to me that day very clear is that 
Both the wide road and the narrow road are the same road divided by a yellow line. And you can be walking on the narrow side, no problem. But don't think you can't step over that line every now and then. God guides us in our everyday life that if we step over that line, we'll step back and stay in a place where we'll be with him. The Holy Spirit seals believers until the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You know, and when you do cross that line occasionally, when you do do something dumb occasionally, I do that, right? We need to understand powerful words from, from the book of Romans. Powerful words. And the words I'm going to leave you right now, and then we're going to sing a beautiful song. I, I was going to sing Amazing Grace, Our Chains Are Gone. We'll do that another time. But as I was praying this morning, I thought we need to, we need to sing Who You Say I Am. Because that's powerful. We are who God says we are, not who we think we are. Our self-esteem should come from our relationship with God, not from what's happening around us, right? This is what Romans says. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Yeshua, right? If you've spoken, if you believe, the words are crystal. It says, there is no longer any condemnation for those that know the Lord. And so if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Yeshua, if, 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 if you're walking that lifestyle and you make some mistakes, that's okay. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Not an excuse to do so, but it happens. But we're given those beautiful, powerful words. There is no condemnation for you who know the Lord. Which means what? I will end up in heaven. I will end up in heaven. So... I'm going to pray at the end, but I, I want us to together, nice and loud. Uh, some of you may know the music. Some of this music's new to people. Um, but this beautiful song, uh, Who You Say I Am. And I, I would love for you, as, as you take out of here whatever the Holy Spirit's laid on your heart and your mind and your spirit, to add that to knowing that uh, God has set you free and you are God's always. Did I have a good one that one? Yeah. Who am I that the highest king
Protect us until we're able to meet again. Bring a healing into our life in those areas that need healings. Be with those who could not be here today, Lord. And just, Father, know that we care about you. And it's great to know that you care about us as well. In Jesus' name. May God the Father. Be with you, guide you, and love you to remember me again in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day, folks.